Welcome. This vlog has been about 30 years in coming. It was inspired by reading Francis Yates' work in the late 1980s. I saw something important that I consider a mistake in Western cultural thought or perception at the beginnings of modernity. The Renaissance, the period that her work focuses on, um, the art and architecture it's both aesthetically pleasing and has a strong mythic force, a sense of unstrained mystery. I wasn't aware that there was theoretical work that reflected Renaissance aesthetics. Uh, but Yeats showed that there were such writings, which had been eclipsed in the minds of subsequent generations. This rich tradition had been variously termed Platonic theology, Christian Kabbalah, the magical hermetic tradition, exemplified in writers like Raymond Lull, Massilio Ficino, Pico della Marandola, Cornelius Grippa, Giordano Bruno, John Dee, and Robert Flood. Recently, I finally got round to reading some of these writers to get a taste of their vision. In my previous video, I spoke of the evolution of consciousness, and I'll use some quotes from Rudolf Steiner's Riddles of Philosophy to give a basic outline of the story leading up to these writers. In the centuries prior to the advent of Christ, we see the emergence of Greek thought, where intellectual forms replace an earlier picture-based consciousness. Yet the way they experienced thought was very different to our experience. Steiner writes, For the Greek thinker, thought came as a perception. Thought had the immediate power of conviction. For the Greeks, it was a question of being able to garner thoughts from the world. They were then themselves the witness of their truth. Then moving into the early Christian centuries, we see spirituality reflected in the intellectual life and the works of Plotinus, Dionysus, Dionysius Seriopagite and the Corpus Emetica. Steiner, after the exhaustion of Greek thought life, an age begins in the spiritual life of mankind in which the religious impulse becomes the driving force of the intellectual world conceptions as well. For Plotinus, his own mystical experience was the source of inspiration of his ideas. Steiner posits that moving into the Middle Ages, the vividness in the way thought was experienced was diminished by the emergence of the ego into consciousness. He says, The thinker of antiquity had the feeling that thought was given to him. The thinker of later time had the impression that he was producing thought. Now Francis Yates drew my attention to Marsilio Ficino who brought back to prominence Plato, Plotinus, Dionysius Areopagite and the Hermetic tradition, all of which he either interpreted or translated into Latin. Through Pico della Mirandola, the Jewish Kabbalah becomes Christianized. Being aware of these writers makes me think that they must have provided the kind of atmosphere that contemporary viewers of Shakespeare's Tempest would have sensed in Prospero. These writers presented a very unified sensibility, melding uh, the unknowable God with divine creation, geometry, myth, mind, spirit, four elements, the great macrocosm and the microcosm of man. John Dee's hieroglyphic monad starts off it is by the straight line in the circle that the first and most simple example of representation of all things may be demonstrated, whether such things be either non-existence or merely hidden under nature's veils. John Dee's quote gives the sense that geometry and theology were aligned. Robert Flood, English Elizabethan and Jacobean philosopher loved illustrations. 
I'll show one of his illustrations um, which maps the microcosm from God represented by his divine name through the three heavens of angels, the fixed stars, the seven planets, the globe of the earth presided over by nature, the soul of the world, with her head in the lower heavens of angels, her right hand bound to God, one foot on the dry land and the other in the sea. The earth has the three realms, animal, vegetable and mineral. The ape of nature is art with its four spheres and many correspondences. What is fascinating about this picture is that it is a map of the great macrocosm. It accepts a harmony between man, God and nature. And not only is it a system of knowledge, it is also aesthetically pleasing. It represents a unified consciousness so at odds with our disparate disciplines of knowledge of the current time. I'll give you a taste of Flood's writings, a quote from the beginning of the history of the macrocosm. Infinite nature, which is boundless spirit, unutterable, not intelligible, outside of all imagination, beyond all essence, unnameable, known only to the heart, most wise, most merciful Father, Word, Holy Spirit, the highest and only good, incomprehensible in height, the unity of all creatures, which is stronger than all power, greater than all distinction, more worthy than all praise, indivisible trinity, most splendid and indescribable light, in short, the divine mind. Free and separate from mortal matter, glory, glory of all, necessity, extremity and renewal, here I say God, the highest and greatest of all, whose name was made blessed in eternity, skillfully formed the admirable machine of the entire macrocosm, and beautifully adorned the structure, even all the philosophers, both ancient and most recent. The most ancient Plato, the innate source of the universe, others, the infinite cause, both outside all things and yet in all things and everywhere. Others, the being of beings, the, pri the prime cause insofar as other causes are derived from it, the maker and originator of all, and according to Plato, the repository of understanding. Next, Plato and Mercurius Trismegistus called him father, in so far as he is the originator of all fecundity and the begetter of all things. Finally, the great chorus of the philosophers, among whom are named Democritus and Orpheus, concludes that God contains every name. Since all is in him and he himself is in everything, not unlike the manner in which all straight lines drawn from the centre to the circumference, are said to be in the centre, or just as number is said to exist in unity, which is the common measure, source and origin of all numbers, and contains every number joined to itself in a unique way. Wherefore the Pythagoreans, and the most learned in science and number, likened the monad, or unity, to God the Maker, because he was alone and by himself, before all, and also because he was the first mover and only activator that existed to complete the huge structure of creation. Moreover, they attributed the dyad or duality to his matter, or subject that he worked on, because it was the second constituent upon which the maker worked to complete the world. And finally, they assigned the triad to that spiritual power, or fiery, shining essence of his, by which the said matter or substrate of the world was brought from potential state to the actual. I think a lot of people reading that now are likely to sort of screw their head up a bit and try and work out exactly what he's saying. Um, and fair enough, you can do that. I think, for me, the importance of it is that he is existing in a set of suppositions that are quite different to our own, uh, which recognizes that there's a con continuity between God, knowledge, nature. And it's almost like uh, reading that you can 
bask in that unity. So in this relatively short section, we see that the starting point is always God, but also how geometry and number are integrated with theology and philosophy. To me, this is also why Renaissance art is so good. It balances divine and human. It is beautiful, glorious, mythical and sanctified. The Renaissance is something of a turning point between the Middle Ages and modernity. In Shakespeare, we get Renaissance colour, but we also have the emergence of the modern sense of the individual. Then there is the birth of modern science. Now, Yeats deals with this in the Rosicrucian Enlightenment through the establishment of the Royal Society. I think the standard line for atheists is that scientific thinking shook off outdated magical and theological thinking through its high-minded rejection of superstition. But Yeats paints a rather different picture. We think is like flood and dee were esteemed, and something happened that stripped away the magic. She writes of the birth of the Royal Society. In the year 1648, for this is the year in which the meetings at Oxford began, which are stated by Thomas Spratt in his official history of the Royal Society, to have been the origin of the Royal Society. These Oxford meetings were held in Wilkins' room at Wadham College, and they ran from about 1648 to about 1659, when the group moved to London and formed the nucleus of the Royal Society, founded in 1660. Yeats adds some colour to the setting, describing the rarities he had seen in Wilkins' rooms at Wadham in 1654. Evelyn says that Wilkins had contrived a hollow statue which uttered words by a long concealed pipe, and that he possessed many other artificial, mathematical and magical curiosities. It's interesting to hear of magical curiosities at the birth of science. While this was happening, the Rosicrucian manifestos were being published in English translation. The teaching of this magico scientific philosophy presents a rather different picture than how science actually developed, although it's worth remembering that Newton himself pursued alchemical studies. John Dee's reputation turned for the worse after his death. He had previously been well regarded as an astrologer to Queen Elizabeth. He had even chosen her coronation day, and she was his patron, although not a bounteous one. He had been consulted by the Royal Navy to help with development of weaponry to defeat the Spanish Armada, designed some of the first stage machinery for the theatre, introduced Euclid with an at the time famous preface, and had one of the largest libraries in Elizabethan England. But in private he had also been running scrying sessions, talking to the angels, uh, and in an act of malice, his magical diaries uh, depicting these were published after his death and his reputation was tarnished as a practitioner of forbidden magic. Although for Dee himself he regarded the magical work he was doing as with angels and therefore entirely white magic, uh, although his scryer, Edward Kelly, was somewhat unsavoury character, who had had his ears cut off for theft. So Dee's reputation turned from that of a fairly central and influential accomplished figure to that of a dark and forbidding bogeyman, to eventually a misguided and foolish purveyor of magic tricks. But Yeats says, Religious passions were still high, and a dreaded witch scare might start at any moment to stop their efforts. So they drop D and make their Baconianism as innocuous as possible. One wonders what they did with the references to the Rosicrucian brothers, their invisibility in their college in the New Atlantis. Yeats goes on. There were many subjects that had to be avoided. Utopian schemes to reform belonged to the revolutionary past, which was now better to forget. The society had many enemies in its earlier years. Its religious position seemed unclear. 
which scares were not altogether a thing of the past. The rule that religious matters were not to be discussed at the meetings, only scientific problems, must have seemed a wise precaution, and in the earlier years the Baconian insistence on experiment and on the collecting of and testing of scientific data guided the society's effort. A permanent society for the advancement of natural science had arrived, a real and visible, not an imaginary and invisible institution, but it was very restricted in its aims compared with earlier movements. It did not envisage the advancement of science within a reformed society, within a universal reformation of the whole world. The fellows of the Royal Society were not concerned with healing the sick, and that gratis, nor with schemes for the reform of education. These men could have had no idea of what lay before the movement they were encouraging. To them its weakness would be more apparent than its strength. The dangers of extinction, which still beset it, they had arrived. They had made an invisible college visible and real, and in order to preserve its delicate existence, great caution was required. It all seemed and was very sensible, and although Baconian experiment was not in itself the infallible high road to scientific advance, yet the Royal Society, so respectable, so well organized, was a statement clear to all that science had arrived. Nothing could stop it now. And suppose most moderns would find that last nothing could stop it now as a, a wonderful endorsement, but I find it sobering and a bit scary. So we can start to recognize the rise of modern science, but it is interesting how the impetus of the move away from magic and platonic theology was not due to a standoffish scientific skepticism towards such things, but because of the threat of persecution. Their mathematics was stripped of its magic to save themselves from the imputation of the diabolical, when to begin with at least their hearts and minds were aflame with magic and divine love. Now this I think had very serious consequences. Suddenly the theological and the experimental were split from one another, and the collection of data came only from this fallen world. Truth took on a small t, and the greater internal origin of truth in God was entirely left out even if it was still in the early practitioner's consciousness. Hopefully what I've said so far gives some colour to the era and the transformations going on. Now I'll end by giving a summary of three main turning points. 1. Renaissance thinking was theistic in nature. God, the good, the true and the beautiful, was at the centre in flood we can see a unified picture of reality from the divine through the angelic, the human and its various arts down into the animal, vegetable and mineral. In reading flood or Ficino, we enjoy a sense of unified consciousness of both aesthetic and philosophical harmony. 2. Science was born in the Royal Society by people with deeply religious sensibility who compromised their ideas of religious and social reform through a fear of persecution. Their ideas were stripped down into an inquiry of the external world. Subsequent generations took the stripped down inquiry as the basis for science and it came to be their exclusive method for discovery of truth. This was a fundamental error and is philosophically naive. Truth is always something found through thinking, through contemplation. It is found within. The bowing down to an idol of an external truth found exclusively through the senses does not make sense and following this path leads to the death of meaning. This is one of the main cultural afflictions of our current time. 3. In a magical paradigm, our experiments are seen as either divine or diabolical, good or evil, of God or the devil. 
but to avoid persecution a myth of science was created as an impartial and amoral realm of disinterested inquiry neither good nor evil but purely for the advancement of a knowledge discreet from and independent of divine knowledge this amoral framework is false none of our actions are outside good and evil and this has allowed many diabolical scientific developments to take place under the guise of amorality that were in fact immoral Thanks for watching.